let the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the new. Together, even as we think in, in this Advent season of the, the, the first coming of Christ, we look forward and we anticipate all that the Christmas celebration is. It's always right in Advent to also anticipate his second coming. And that's what we're going to sing about now. And in fact, the writer of this, of this next song, Isaac Watts, is also the one who wrote the song in the choir saying earlier, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. And both are actually speaking about Christ's second coming. He rules the world in truth and grace, and he makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. And if you're in Christ, your heart longs to see this happen. You long for him to return. You know, we know in Romans 8 that we don't see everything under his control right now, but there is coming a future time where that's going to be displayed for all the world. Every tongue is going to confess that Christ is Lord. So we can celebrate that now. Jesus shall reign.
Heavenly Father, we know that even as Romans 8 tells us, we do not yet see everything under your control. We look around us and we see, we see wickedness prospering. We see you staying your hand. And we know that it is not that your arm is shortened that you cannot save, but it is instead that you are, you are showing your grace and your mercy, your long-suffering, calling men to repentance. But we look forward to the day, Lord, when you return and you, you display what is just what has just been shown here, Psalm 97, that all of the earth is going to be filled with your visible glory, and you're going to rule and reign. We look forward to the day when you will rule the nations in truth and grace, and you will make them prove the glories of your righteousness and the wonders of your love. And until that time, we anticipate and rejoice in your first advent and in all that Christmas means. And we look forward to your second advent, and we pray this morning, Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And until that time, we have your word, which is enough for us. We pray that you would teach us by it, and that you would incline our hearts, even this morning, to long for your second advent. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Man, wasn't that exciting? Exciting lyrics, exciting truth to anticipate, arranged wonderfully and musically. If you're not excited about that, you got to check to see if you have a pulse. That is really, really thrilling truth. Take your Bibles, if you would, and look with me at Luke chapter 6, where we have been uh, observing, sort of uh, eavesdropping really on the ministry of Christ in this great gospel to the Gentiles. And of course, um, we find Jesus uh, getting away to pray, to spend some time in prayer. And if you have studied the gospels at all, you know that throughout his ministry, he, he kept using this very curious phrase over and over again when it came to the pace and the schedule of his ministry, he would often say, my hour has not yet come. And for those within earshot, it was a bit of a curious phrase and confusing, though it was very, very uh, planned by Christ, purposed by Christ. He would say it to his mother at the wedding of Cana when he performed his first miracle. She came to him to say, can you help us with this situation? I know you have power from on high. And he used this little idiom to say, to sort of distance himself from the circumstances and, and say, what, what, it was basically, what am I, on demand? My time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. What is this between me and you when my hour has not yet come? Messianic signs being what they are, it can invite the trouble of Israel, and I don't want that to happen too early. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, being on his Father's schedule, would often say to those around him, my hour has not yet come. The Gospel of John records several times where John himself says that they wanted to seize him, that is the Pharisees, but his hour had not yet come. Chapter 7, they wanted to take him, verse 6 and verse 8, but his hour hadn't come. Chapter 7, verse 30, same thing. There was this desperate desire to silence him, but his hour had not yet come. Chapter 8, verse 20 of John's gospel, same thing. But then, as he got near the end of his ministry, and when he was with his disciples, he would then begin to say, particularly in that final week, my hour has come, or the hour has come. Chapter 12, just before they got to the place where they would have their final meal together, chapter 12, verse 23 and 27. The hour has come for him to go to his death. It was upon him. There was no more holding back for the purposes of spreading the gospel. He was going to go to the cross. Chapter 13, verse 1, his hour had come, and so they prepared the meal together. John 16, 32, John 17, verse 1, same thing. Father, the hour has come for you to glorify your Son. What we note from Jesus' own statements, both the early statements that his hour wasn't here and the statements through the end of his life that the hour had come upon him, is that Jesus himself, aligned with his Father's will, was orchestrating the circumstances and details 
of his life, his ministry, and his death. He was sovereignly orchestrating them. He was making them happen, picking the details, making sure that everything was after the will of his father. It's exactly what he told the Pharisees in John 8. I always do what my father wants me to do. I never do anything on my own initiative. So as the God-man while on earth, he's always following the plan and sovereignly orchestrating and carrying out the details of his own life and his ministry and eventually his death. And he did it for the sake of the gospel because if he doesn't take care of the details, if he doesn't as the man, Christ Jesus, follow the plan, we have no gospel. And so even all the way back into the halfway point of his ministry when he was choosing his Disciples, it was part of the sovereign plan, the details being worked out in the orchestration of it. And we see that in Luke chapter 6. He, he made his choice, and we've been looking at the features of this choice. It's been very interesting to kind of draw out some principles. We want to finish those today. I'm going to give you six of them. I gave you two last time and introduced the third. What is it in this choice, and why does Jesus have to go off to pray all night long, as the text says in verse 12 of Luke 6? Why does he have to spend the entire night in prayer off alone on a mountain to make this choice? We saw last time that, first of all, it's because it was a a dependent choice. As God, he's already aligned with his Father's will, but as a man, he needs to... Trust his father's will. He needs to bring his human will into alignment. Not that it was out of alignment in a sinful way, but to affirm the aligning of his humanity with God's purposes. And so he went away to the mountain to pray because he needed to plan some time for undistracted alignment of his will and persistence in prayer to to know his Father's purposes by the power of the Spirit, to depend on the Father's purposes, and in prayer to believe his Father and to affirm his faith and to submit his will. That's why he went alone. It was a dependent time, a submissive time to worship, to petition, to believe, to trust, to persist, and not have any distractions. This is a monumental decision. We'll see that in a moment. So first, it was a dependent choice. Second, it was a weighty choice. We use the word grave. I like that word. It's a, it's a weighty choice because this is, this is a depending upon the Father for the choice of the men who would be the first apostles sent out on behalf of the new covenant. This would be the group of men sent out for that grand task that he gives to his disciples, both in Matthew 28 and then when he spoke to them, recorded in Acts chapter 1, I'm sending you first here, then to Judea, then beyond into Samaria, then to the remotest parts of the earth. Really? The whole earth, global gospel ministry, from this small group? This is a weighty decision. This needs to be the sovereign purposes of God. This needs to be prayed about so that Jesus affirms the alignment of his heart and his will with the Father. That leads us thirdly then to the sovereignty of the choice. Notice verse 13. It's a sovereign choice. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them whom he also named as apostles. He appointed these 12. He appointed them. In John 15, when They've already been with him for a while and they're already failing and already struggling and already battling the flesh and they're weak and vulnerable and Jesus is their only word of eternal life. He's their only strength. He's their only encouragement, their only bolstering of their faith. To be around him is to to be strengthened and encouraged and they're still weak even though they've spent so much time with him. And then he gets in the upper room and he puts on the basin and the towel and he's with his disciples and they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And his very act of humbling himself humbles their pride and they see it for the ugliness that it is. And so they need encouragement. And in John 15, in the upper room, he says, you did not choose me, but 
I chose you. I chose you. Why? And appointed you, Jesus said, to go and bear fruit. And what an encouragement that would have been. All I've ever seen is my weakness. All I've ever seen right here when you're washing our feet is my pride. Peter was, again, his, his impulsive self saying, no, you, I should be washing your feet. You shouldn't be doing this to me. Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Well, then cleanse my whole person. Give me a bath. I want what you have, what you have to offer. You don't need a bath. You're already clean inside. But you do need the daily cleansing that I offer you. You need to follow me, Peter. You need to trust me. They could see the ugliness of their argumentativeness and their pride and their selfishness. It would have been a huge encouragement to know that he had chosen them and appointed them to go and bear fruit. This is a sovereign choice from God. And he says to them in verse 19 of John 15, the world's going to hate you. Why? Because it hated me first and because I chose you out of the world. What a comfort. So it was a sovereign choice. And it was for the purpose of appointing them and sending them. And notice, for eternal distinction. Notice he also named them as apostles. There is to be, for these, eventually 11, minus Judas, and then Matthias added, as Acts chapter 1 tells us. So eventually, it will be the 11 plus Matthias, but they would be the eternally distinguished sent ones. They were chosen by Jesus. He spent the whole night in prayer to pick those who would be eternally distinguished as the first sent ones of the new covenant. Now, in your New Testament, you'll often see the word apostle with a capital A when it's referring to the 12. And there are other times when the word for apostle is used, Philippians 2, 25, it is used and it is translated often as ministers, but it's the same word, apostolos. You see the same thing in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23, where ministers are in the church. So there's a sense in which we're all sent ones, ambassadors for Christ, with a small a. But these would be the first sent by Christ as his ambassadors with the authority of the new covenant. They would have the authority of the new covenant and it would mark them out in eternity with distinction. Now, Jesus says it to them with specificity. You can jot down Matthew 19, 28 and study it for your own, on your own. But in Matthew 19, 28, here's what Jesus said to the disciples. Truly, I say to you, you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That, by the way, is exactly what the Apostle John saw in his vision In the Apocalypse, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, he says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. What did he see? He saw the thrones of these marked out ambassadors of the new covenant. And in chapter 21 of Revelation, verse 14, Jesus says, through the Apostle John, by the power of the Spirit, that the wall of the new city had 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This selection of men is important. It's a sovereign appointment. It marks them out for eternal distinction. Why? Because they would carry the authority of the new covenant. And so Jesus prayed all night because he wanted the Father's choice. He wanted the humanity of his heart to affirm its alignment with the purposes of God in the selection of these men. Fourthly, the fourth feature of the choice Jesus makes and why he spent all night in prayer is because it was a replicating choice. It was a replicating choice. You say, what do you mean? I mean it was a gospel-driven choice. It was gospel-driven in the sense that if you pick the wrong men, if you pick men that aren't the supreme choice, if you pick men that won't be empowered, if you pick men that will not be the ones intended, you're not the son of man, therefore you're not the savior, and these men will fail. 
And so in this wonderful prayer and submissiveness and dependence, Jesus wants to make the choice of these men with gospel extension in mind. In fact, look at Mark's gospel, chapter 3. You see the specific statements about this when Jesus chooses the men. A very, very important text that gives you the, the details behind the appointment of these. Notice... Verse 13 of Mark chapter 3, he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him, and he appointed 12 <clears throat> so that they would be with him. There's that first purpose. And that he could send them out to preach. There's the second purpose. And to have authority to cast out the demons. So the first purpose of his choosing them, was that he could train them as his disciples. There was to be training. There was to be the passing on of truth, the passing of the baton, speaking to them, ministering to them, granting them faith, protecting that faith, strengthening that faith. This would be training, discipleship, hands-on, apprenticeship, mentoring for the entire time until he ascended to heaven. And then when he ascended to heaven, he was purposing to send them out to preach. So they would be the ambassadors of the new covenant who would preach this gospel. Listen, if they don't succeed, the gospel doesn't come anywhere. It doesn't come any further. And they have an authority that particularly manifests itself in the ability to cast out the demons. <clears throat> now you got to ask the question, why? Why authority in that particular way to cast out demons? Well, let's think about the apostolic role at first. They would later be men endowed with particular power from on high such that it was called the signs of an apostle. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul calls them the signs of an apostle. Miraculous power to attend the proclamation of the message. Why was that important? Well, listen, you had the Jews who were the old covenant. You had the Jews who were in the commonwealth of Israel. They were in the covenant and all Gentile nations were out. So when God saves 3,000 Jews on that first day in the new covenant, and Peter and the apostles are telling them, hey, the Gentiles are coming the same way. They're included in the covenant. They have access to Jesus, or to the Father through Jesus Christ the same way the Jews do. They're just as privileged. They receive everything the Jews receive. Well, there's no way that after generations of heritage and commonwealth in Israel and covenant with God that any Jew is going to buy into that idea. And so the apostles, all Jewish, they end up preaching a message of Jew and Gentile coming together. You can see that in Ephesians 2. And they have an attending power. They have signs that they perform that let people know that this message is true. But why the particular expression of power over demons? Why that? Well, think about it. The authority to cast out demons was important because once Jesus ascended to heaven, if Satan had any interest in crushing the gospel at any time, it would have been right then. Satan, if he could cut off the gospel from ever making it beyond the ascension of Jesus, he would have gained some victory because the promise was that the gospel would go to the ends of the earth, that there would be disciples made of all nations. And once Jesus left the earth, if, if Satan could discredit the gospel, he would have. If he could have destroyed this little band of misfit men that Jesus left alone, he would have. If he could have crushed their vulnerability, stolen their faith, caused others not to believe their message, caused them to cower in a corner, then he could have caused the gospel to be ignored, the writings of the disciples to be rejected, the disciples that followed them initially would fall away quickly in fear. The gospel never would have gone forth. So Jesus, in choosing them, gives them power over the kingdom of darkness in exactly the way he had power over the kingdom of darkness. He told demons to leave, they left. He told demons to be quiet, they were quiet. He moved them from this host to another host, they went. They threw human beings on the ground when he was on the earth and said, we know who you are. Have you come to judge us and torment us before it's time? 
And so what Jesus was doing is giving these men of the new covenant the power specifically over the kingdom of darkness so that everyone would know that Satan has been vanquished, he has no ultimate power over the souls of men, and that the message of forgiveness in Christ and a clean conscience is real. And these men would be the ones who would demonstrate that. Furthermore, they would also be eyewitnesses. 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 4 says, What we have seen, what we've heard, what our hands have handled concerning the word of life, we now testify to you as eyewitnesses. We sometimes use the word witness, don't we? Oh, we go and witness to that person. Well, it's true. We do, in the extended sense, become witnesses. And even in church history, the, the Greek term for witness, which is the term we get, from which we get martyr, uh, in a broader sense, it was used of the people of God who might go with the gospel to the end of their life and be killed for it. But technically, in the New Testament, the term witness is reserved for the eyewitnesses who were those who saw Jesus walked with him, and especially these who walked with him as ambassadors sent out by him. So they would be the eyewitnesses to confirm what Jesus told them, They would write it down. Some of them in this group would be the ones who would write it under the inspiration of the Spirit. John 14, 26, the Spirit would remind them of everything Jesus said, and they would write it down. And then everyone through the centuries would believe in Christ because of what they wrote, and they would know that, every one of us would know that those disciples who'd who'd become apostles and appointed for the gospel What they wrote was authoritative. What they wrote can be believed in, counted on, and that the Old Testament was affirmed to them by Christ, and they were the writers under the inspiration of the Spirit of the New Covenant. And so you have this succession, this unbreakable chain, this traceable line from their authority all the way down to you and me. And it's right here. We have their writings. The affirmation of the Old Testament from Jesus to them, they affirmed the Old Testament in their writings, they quoted it as Scripture, and then they wrote the New Testament. It's an unbreakable chain. Had that never happened, you and I wouldn't have the gospel. Had that never happened, we wouldn't have a successive unbreakable chain, a traceable line of authority back to the apostles, and therefore back to Christ. Jesus made sure this would happen. And when he left, he sent his spirit. Look, if he doesn't, if he doesn't send the spirit this doesn't happen. If he doesn't go, the Spirit doesn't come, and if he doesn't send the Spirit, it doesn't happen, and if the apostles fail at the job, then it doesn't happen. It's a traceable line of authority. Even in the beginning of the church, when the Holy Spirit was being bestowed, you know what what happens in the book of Acts? See, for, for all of Christianity throughout the centuries, when you believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit has entered your life. He is now a permanent resident. You have all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to have at regeneration. But in the very beginning, there were some who believed, some Gentiles who believed in Jesus... But the Holy Spirit hadn't visibly come upon them. Why? Because in that transition period, the apostles would lay their hands on those Gentiles and all the Jews standing around would see that when the apostles laid their hands on the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit visibly came upon them. What did that do? It connected in their minds. Oh, oh, that's the authority of Christ. That's the power of Christ given to these apostles as the heads of the church who then... on on Christ's behalf, who would then bestow the visible manifestation of the presence, the real presence of the Holy Spirit. It was only for a time so that all the Jew and Gentiles would know that they were all saved the same way. And it would be affirmed by this group of men, the apostles, given the authority of the new covenant by Christ. Then they would lay the foundation of the church doctrine, Ephesians 2.20, The church is built in its doctrine and its teachings on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, prophets being the ones who spoke the truth and the apostles then in the group who wrote it down. Everything was breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3.16. Everything pertaining to life and godliness was given in the scripture, 2 Peter 1.3. See, what's the point, Pastor? Look, Jesus took care of all these details when he went away and prayed and selected these men. He took care of every detail down 
to the specifics. And he made sure it was what God wanted. He made sure it was the right choice of the right men. He affirmed the alignment of his human will with the Father's purposes because when he got up in the morning, he would be the God-man and he would be making that selection out of the group. He wanted it to be right so that the gospel would not be thwarted. He secured every avenue of truth so that it would come all the way down through history without being stopped or lost or discredited or overthrown by evil. Jesus did that for you and me. It was a replicating choice. How sweet of the Savior to think of us. How sweet of the Savior in this moment making this choice to go away and pray all night to make that kind of choice. How precious a love he has for his people to take that kind of time to affirm the alignment of his will and purposes with his Father and to trust his Father and to get up and make that choice. To make the choice of those men it was a replicating choice. But it was an unlikely choice. It was highly unlikely. That's number five, the fifth feature of this choice. It was unlikely. Why? There's no rank. There's no status in this group of guys. There's no adequacy. There's, there's nothing that you would be drawn to or attracted to. There's nothing to commend them. It's just a group of misfits, it seems. And in the Gospels, whenever they are named and called the Twelve, we don't have time to go over it, but, but they are always listed in the same way or the same grouping, indicating that of this group, there were some that Jesus pulled in really close and gave some bigger tasks. There were others that were a little bit uh, they, they were close to Jesus, but not given the same level of tasks, so there was a little less intimacy. And then there was another group, uh, sort of on the fringes, where there was less intimacy, but nonetheless, all were close to Jesus, all walked with Jesus. And when you look at these names, it is bizarre that they would even appear. In Luke 6, notice... Verse 14, and we're, we're looking at 2,000 years of New Covenant history here. We, we know what the Scripture says about these men, but look at this list. Simon, whom he also named Peter. <laughs> I mean, that just invokes all kinds of things. Andrew, his brother, James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, by the way, he's also called Thaddeus in the other Gospels, and Judas Iscariot, Luke says, who became a traitor. In the list, you have the first group of three. You have Peter and his brother Andrew and then James and John. They always appear first in the list. And it seems as though in the gospel record that we know most about them, there's most written about them and their interaction with Jesus and the responsibilities he gave them. And Peter seems to rise to the surface as the spokesperson of the four. Peter, his brother Andrew, James, and John. They just, it just flows off the tongue. These are the men we know most about. The second group may be a little bit less um, tasked by Jesus, walking with him, spending time with him, but, no, but a little bit um, less close, especially in times of intensity and prayer when Jesus pulled Peter, James, and John close to him. In the second group, you have Philip, Nathaniel, Thomas, and Matthew. Nathaniel is also Bartholomew, as we have it here. And then the third group, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, or Judas, the son of James, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. In the second group, Philip seems in the texts to rise to the surface as the spokesperson, and perhaps James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, the one in the final group. They're, they're an extreme contrast in personality. As I said, there's no rank here, there's no status here, there's no... There's nothing great to commend them to society as these great leaders. What you have here is a contrast. We already know by just reading the names, some of it that conjures up in our minds. Peter. Peter is angry, typically belligerent, prone to overreacting. Uh, he is impulsive. He's anxious. John, on the other hand, while... while uh, you know, uh, willing to be bold, as he and his brother James are called later, called the sons of thunder. They're willing to be bold with the truth, but 
you know, John's complete opposite from Peter. John's kind of tenderhearted. He's, he's um, less stubborn, it seems, than Peter. And they're stuck together in that first group. Nathaniel seems ready to believe, according to the gospel accounts. Thomas, on the other hand, is skeptical. You have those that seem ready and willing to sort of own up to things, and then Thomas is skeptical and always questioning. You have Matthew, who's a traitor to the Romans, and then you have Simon the Zealot, who's a radical revolutionary. I mean, the contrast can't get any more sharp. It's just amazing, isn't it? Jesus chose these. He saw wretched men, self-centered men, stubborn guys, and he wants to work with them and teach them and model divine love to them and make them into servants who change the world for him. I'm sure that as he spent time with them, not only did they see their sin come out all over the place, but they must have been stunned at the reality that they were chosen. And listen, beloved, they weren't chosen to shine in and of themselves, obviously, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 says, we have the gospel treasure in an earthen vessel, an earthly, fallen, uh, everyday pot that people used for for the mundane things of life, if not the worst parts of, of waste in life. That's what we are, that's what we're called, earthen vessels of no value in which God placed the treasure of the gospel. Why? so that the power might be of God and not of ourselves. Listen, God selected them, he selected you. Here we are in Christ. Look at us. Look at this group. It's a motley group. We're difficult. Some of you are relating to Peter, yeah. Mm. We call him the apostle with the foot shaped. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but anybody here with a <laughs> tendency to have your foot in your mouth and you, the only time it isn't is when you're exchanging feet? <laughs> I mean, that's Peter. Any Johns here, tenderhearted, um, willing to believe, and when you learn a truth, you really go after it with people, but you need some humility, and yet you are willing to believe? Anybody like that? Anybody like uh, Andrew, kind of quiet behind the scenes, always telling people to go to Jesus, but kind of timid, maybe not as courageous? Anybody like Matthew, willing to make a buck at anyone's expense, and all of a sudden you're saved, and you still have that tendency to kind of want to take advantage of people? Maybe you have some old friends, old lifestyle stuff that keeps hanging on your life as baggage. Anybody like Thomas? Uh, unless I see it, I won't believe I mean, we can relate to these people. Jesus selected them so that he would shine, not that they would shine. There's a great illustration told in church history of a person who painted the Lord's Supper, and when he asked his friend to look at it, his friend looked at it, and to the artist's consternation, the friend said, those cups are the most glorious cups I've ever seen. And the artist grabbed a brush and shockingly painted over the cups in this magnificent work and he said, I failed. I wanted you to see Christ and you saw cups. This is what Jesus is doing. He's not choosing the adequate, those of rank, those of intellect. He's not choosing them. You, You might indeed have some of those attributes but if you don't use them for the Lord, that's a problem. God's not interested in what you think you want to be, and he's certainly not interested in us increasing in the portrait, overshadowing Christ. The focus is to be Christ. And he chose these men not because in the list there are these that we're drawn to. Wow, this is an amazing, self-starting, self-disciplined, educated, religious elite group of people. It's not. They're a study in contrasts and wretchedness and selfishness and pride. And remember the task. It's a, it's a choice to send them out as the ambassadors of the new covenant with authority. How are they going to use that power? How are they going to respond if it threatens their life? Are they going to run off the job? It's not about them. It's about what Christ can do with them. That's the same as us today. 
There's a fictitious little notation that comes created by someone which includes the resume of the apostles to Jesus, the son of Joseph, Woodcrafters Carpenter Shop in Nazareth, from the Jordan Management Consultants. Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you've picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests. We've not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. The profiles of all tests are included, and you will want to study each of them carefully. As part of our service, we make some general comments for your guidance, much as an auditor would include some general statements. This is given as a result of staff consultation and comes without any additional fee. It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. They don't have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. And we feel it's our duty to tell you that Matthew's been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings. And they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He's a man, a man of ability and resourcefulness. He meets people well. He has a keen business mind, and his contacts are in high places. He's highly motivated. He's ambitious and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All the other profiles are self-explanatory, sincerely Jordan Consultants. These men were an unlikely choice, and lastly and sixthly, Jesus approaches this choice and he makes a scandalous choice. It was a dependent choice, a weighty and grave choice. It was a sovereign choice. It was a gospel driven choice, a replicating choice. It ultimately was an unlikely choice, and yet it was a scandalous choice. It was scandalous in two ways. One, it was a most amazing grace to Judas. In the common grace of God, it was an offer of time with the Savior over and over again. And it was a scandalous choice in the sense that it was unspeakable grace to us. Because eventually, Judas would be the one chosen particularly by Christ to let his heart run toward betrayal. Look at John 13 for a moment and we'll finish there. John 13. Here's Jesus with his disciples in the upper room. And he says, after he's washed their feet, John 13, verse 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. But I do not speak to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So Jesus is fulfilling scripture in the choice. He knows scripture. He's aligned with the scriptures. And he tells the disciples because he's granted them faith. He's strengthening their faith. He's guarding their faith. He's affirming their faith. Notice verse 19. From now on I'm telling you before it comes to pass so that when it occurs you may believe that I am he. I'm going to strengthen your faith. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. I'm sending you out, and you can know for sure if they receive you, they are receiving me. If they deny your apostolic authority and your apostolic witness, if they deny the scriptures you wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, they are denying Jesus Christ no matter what they say. You have that kind of place in the new covenant ministry. That's an encouragement to you. Verse 21, and yet when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. And he testified and said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. Judas Iscariot is declared in scripture the most wicked of all human beings because he was more freely exposed to the most lavish privileges of grace than any other person for all time. And it is said in scripture that he is better off never to have been born. He was personally selected by the Lord to do the work alongside him in the incarnate redemptive ministry of the Son of God, he saw that. He saw it firsthand and up close. He saw every display of Jesus' miracles and power and authority over all things. He heard every perfectly delivered and flawless sermon given by Jesus Christ to the masses. He was taught personally and discipled personally by Jesus day by day. He watched every deed Jesus did, every act of holiness, every practice of Jesus' life for roughly three years or a little bit less. He never saw Jesus sin. He never heard him say the wrong thing. He never caught him in a moment of error or hypocrisy. He was personally never mistreated by Jesus. In fact, he was never without the Lord's perfect supply of resources, never without the Lord's ready comfort, never without the kindness of the Lord in his responses of the heart and his compassionate brotherliness. He always enjoyed Jesus' personal attention to the need. He was always under the Lord's powerful protection and security. He benefited greatly from all of these things. It was like no other time in his life. Listen, Judas, the one who would betray Christ, whom he's referring to in this 13th chapter of John, came to enjoy friendship with Jesus And he watched the impact of Jesus and he was exposed to the growth and maturity of the disciples whom Jesus influenced. He even enjoyed the implicit trust and respect of the others and that should have softened his heart toward the joys of doing what is right. And listen, Jesus Christ pulled Judas in close. He selected him as an enemy and he pulled him in close as an enemy. Judas' character is well known. A chapter earlier in John's gospel, a woman had come and took an entire year's worth of very, very costly perfume and anointed Jesus with it and the scriptures say that God allowed that to happen providentially as a pre-burial anointing in the providence of God this woman became an instrument in the hands of almighty God to anoint Jesus before his burial in an act of worship to show who he was it was just the father's pleasure to do it and Judas leading the rest of the disciples John 12 1 to 8 says that he led the other disciples in saying why was this waste occurring when we could have taken that same money and given it to the poor. We could have sold that perfume, gotten a lot of money for the ministry and given it to the poor. And it says there in John chapter 12 that Judas said that because he secretly, being the treasurer of the the ministry resources, used to take money. He was greedy, selfish, a thief, hypocritical, and slowly as he began to pilfer money, he never paid it back into the treasury, and he became more greedy. And why? Because Judas had one agenda, and it wasn't Christ, and it wasn't the kingdom. It was his own purpose to exalt himself above the things he hated, namely Rome, namely the religious establishment in Jerusalem, and he wanted Jesus to get down there and start getting about the business of this insurrection so that they could finally be in power, and Judas would be the guy. He'd be controlling the government, controlling the empire, the money man, the trusted one. That's what he wanted. 
Do you think Jesus knew those things? Of course he knew those things. He selected Judas to be one of the 12, knowing that that's what Judas would be like. And so Jesus says that one of you will betray me. Notice verse 26 of John 13. And he answered, as they're saying, is it me, is it me, is it me? I mean, they're not even suspecting Judas. They're suspecting themselves the guy was so trusted. And Jesus said, it is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he took it, gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. This is the one. And John records it so we know for all time. It was the last one in the list, the only one outside of Judea and in his background. He was the one. And shockingly, he ends up in the list of the 12, only later to be removed in this moment. Jesus chose his enemy. In fact, in the garden, you remember what happened in the garden? Judas had done the deed. You know, Jesus sent him out, go do what you do, do it quickly. Judas left. Satan filled his heart the moment that morsel had been given to him. Jesus knew that. That means Satan was in the room ready to pounce and Jesus was allowing it. Jesus had pulled his enemy close. He had even given him food in that gesture around this intimate meal and Jesus knew Satan was crouching at the door and the moment Judas ate the morsel, Satan entered his heart and Jesus said, go. And here is Jesus orchestrating his own demise Choosing the ones early on that would be faithful and also choosing his enemy. Why? Because scandalously, he was going to the cross no matter what. He chose those who would be faithful to bring the gospel to you and me, and he chose the one who would betray him, who would make the gospel possible. He orchestrated the whole thing. This is stunning. This is absolutely staggering. And in the garden... Judas had done the deal and he brought the soldiers from Antonio's fortress. We don't know how many, but it must have been chaotic. At the very least, 200. Maybe more. Some estimate 600. In the chaos of the middle of the night, there's all this clanking and armor and they're coming with torches. But Judas had arranged to be way out ahead of them so that when he got into the garden, he wouldn't be suspected. Maybe he was coming to tell them what all the chaos was. And he walks up And John 18 records that he lavishly kissed Jesus repeatedly. I mean, the enemy's pretense is an indignity and Jesus gives himself to the indignity. He's finished praying and his own 11, who will be the ones he sends out, can't even stay awake for an hour. And he says, wake up, he's coming and they, he goes to the edge of the garden and there's Judas and he gives himself to the betrayer's kiss. And don't you know that months earlier when he was on the mountain praying as Luke records it, he's praying about this night. Father, get me to that night, all the way to that night. Help me embrace the enemy all through my earthly ministry. Help me embrace him all the way to the garden. And when he comes to betray me with kisses, help me walk right up to him. I want to die so that I can love my disciples to the utmost. He didn't grieve over the loss of his own life. He even grieved for Judas. Say, how do you know? Because right there in the upper room, right there in the upper room was an offer of the truth. One of you is not with me. Isn't that a gracious comment? And then, in the garden, Judas, do you betray me with a kiss? There's another gracious offer. I know you high Calvinists sometimes think that it would be impossible for Jesus to love Judas, but he did love Judas. Do you know how we know? Matthew 5, 44 and 45, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, listen, you are to love your enemies, and in so doing, you are like your heavenly Father who sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Wow. Jesus pulled his enemy close. He didn't love him savingly. We know that. Judas went to destruction as God had prophesied. 
But he loved him in the common grace of the offer of the gospel, and there he was in the garden offering it again. But he knew what would happen. He knew when he chose Judas on that day that Judas would have a heart filled with unbelief and greed and ingratitude and treachery and duplicity and hypocrisy and hatred. He knew that. Yet he still offered him the truth. What a lesson to those disciples standing around that Jesus offered himself to his enemy. Listen, beloved, when he made that choice, that's... That's how he approached that choice. Dependent, worshipful, prayerful, undistracted persistence so that it might be a recognition of the gravity of the choice and that he would align and be aligned and be affirmed in the alignment of his will and purposes with his fathers and that he would trust his heavenly father and that it would be a replicating choice, gospel-driven interest to the remotest part of the earth. I gotta choose 11 guys that the Father wants me to choose so they would be the first who would take it. And that it would get all the way down to GIBC today. And that you could take that same word and give it to the next generation of lost souls and God would save them through your testimony. And you would know God is still saving until he judges. And it was an unlikely choice, wasn't it? I mean, weren't you an unlikely choice? I was an unlikely choice, are you kidding? I was a rebel the moment God saved me. It was radical heart and mind transformation. My life still needed to be cleaned up. Well, my heart was changed. When you came to Christ, it was an unlikely choice, okay? You weren't more savable than the guy next to you. I was religious, I came to church, that's when I was saved. Sorry, sorry pal. All that is is just wicked pretense. God saved some Pharisees. He didn't save all of them. He saved some in the world's empire. He didn't save all of them. All of us are running from God's grace and he reaches out and he rescues the most unlikely, not many mighty, not many noble. When Jesus chose the 12, he chose 11 of the most unlikely, least likely to get the global gospel ministry done And he even chose his enemy to make the gospel possible. Do we not have the most precious Savior? Bow with me. Lord, thank you that your choice of the master's men was such a scandalously gracious choice. You knew it would end in your death. And you chose your enemy to secure that. And you knew it would end in, ultimately in your resurrection and the sending of your spirit in your exaltation and ascension to descend upon the lives of 11 and then an added one later who would then become the authoritative, eternally distinguished, first sent ones And you laid the foundation of the church upon their faithfulness. It doesn't put their cup on display. It just puts you on display. How in the world does Peter go from arrogant, unbelieving, impulsive disciple to powerful preacher? The same way we go from unlikely, inadequate, useless rebels to soft-hearted, mind-renewed, regenerate, useful, slaves of the sweetest master. And you empower us in your word. We, we build up the body. We, we worship you with a right heart, though imperfect. And, and we even proclaim your truth and people come to Christ because of our testimony. Thank you for spending that night in prayer. What an overwhelming night that was before you chose. And may we worship because of it. May we be reinvigorated because of it. May we never sit on the sidelines but always walk faithfully in you because of it. 
Thank you for choosing the 11 and thank you for choosing your enemy. Thank you for the scandal of our salvation and the scandal of your sovereign plan to choose the one who would be the result, would result in your demise. Lord, your grace is overwhelming to us. Now help us to live in light of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand if you will, and, and I just want to say to all of you who are guests in our midst, if you're visiting family or just enjoying some time with grandkids and kids and, and uh, friends, welcome to GIBC. We're glad you came. Tonight, 6 o'clock, is our final concert. If you've not been, you don't want to miss it. Some of you, I know, are already coming back for another night, and uh, we rejoice with that as well. Uh, come early, um, and you're going to just have a great, great evening. Time for us to celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the arrival of our Messiah, the one who would be born to die. Uh, if you're our guest and you're looking for a, a church to join, we'd love to tell you about it, so just come see us, talk with us. We, we'd, we'd love to uh, encourage you in that way. Lord bless you, have a great day, and hopefully we'll see you tonight. For our ch church family, desserts and snacks, whatever you can bring tonight, we're going to feed everybody and just have a great time of fellowship. God bless you.